Hello and welcome to the Deep Down NBA podcast. My name's Sean and joining me as always is the one and only Dante Boffer, Mr. Boffer Man. How are we on this sad day? Leading question, but how are we on this sad day for Australian basketball? As an Australian, I'm battered, bruised and bronze, hopefully, yeah. if we can beat the loser of France or Slovenia. Yeah. Um, would Aaron Baines have made a difference in this 97-78 uh, loss to the United States today? Uh, I I don't think so. You know, you can soak up those Nick K minutes or the Nathan Sobey minutes. Um, I, I'm not selling it. No, nah, I, I I don't know. I mean, like I feel like K and Landau have played really well this whole run, but it was a little bit scary when they opened up in the first possession yeah. Nick K versus Nick K one on one versus KD on yeah. the field, and I was like, oh no, that yeah. seems like it's a bad idea. Um, but- I'm not sure what Baines would have done. You know. Just, that just smacked the shit out of him on an off-ball screen. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. You could have just that shoulder into him hit. Yeah, yeah. I, I like I like a two-year contract for the San Antonio Spurs, Jock Landale. So I, I like how he's more of a mobile big, um, kind of a bit too weak to maybe defend other people. So he's on the other end of the spectrum from Aaron Baines there. But I like I liked Landale for Australia's point of view on KD and and even Matisse Tybal. Like obviously he's incredible, but he was like jumping a step before KD was about to shoot the ball, jumping as high as he could, just like trying to contest it. Um, and obviously he made shot after shot after shot after shot uh, and kept him in it just enough so that they could run away and have like a fucking 60 to 20 turnaround at the end of the game. Yeah, that second half was not pretty from from Australia's point of view. Yeah, I, I tell you, the worst case scenario from now on is, so France goes through to the grand final game and the worst case would be Luka Doncic and a collection of nobodies beats the fucking boomers in the bronze medal game and we lose another medal game. That would that would kill me, I reckon. Yeah, but I feel like I kind of feel like there's no shame in losing to Luka. I no, I, I I do. I do. I think it's incredible what Luka's been able to do on the Olympics. But the, the rest of this team isn't very good, man. Like you got Goran Dragic's brother, you've got this one dude who played for Virginia or something. Uh and that's it. A couple of blokes named Zlatko, probably. Yeah, a lot of itches. Well, the 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 American commentator who uh, Olympic basketball watchers will be very familiar with, the kind sounding old man, he described Slovenia as the little engine that could. <laughs> so maybe they can. Maybe they can. <laughs> Side note: if anyone knows that bloke's name, this kind sounding American man, please let us know because um, I did some sleuthing and I was unable to find his name, but I just literally just feel like he's my grandfather or something just someone who cares very deeply about me and the basketball and the viewing experience so yeah uh but he he can come on the pod after the after the thing when after the olympics when his identity is revealed yes oh i'd love to have him on (laughs) uh all right well let's um Let's let's quit the small talk. Um, there's actually this is um, just going to continue the small talk. I actually called this old <laughs> old work friend um, who's now with a different company the other day, and I called him and I was just like, you know, I needed to like ask a favor for something you know work related, and then because we used to work together for like over a year, I called him. I was like, oh hey, you know, um, not what's it called uh, redacted. Um, yeah, I was just like, hey, how you going? He's like, yeah, good, how are you? I'm like, all right, should we go through the pleasantries or should I just get into what I want? And he goes, oh, no, go through the pleasantries. And I'm like, oh, how's lockdown? You know, thank God I'm not in Sydney. <laughs> and, then, and then we just started <laughs> talking about what we wanted to talk about. And I'm like, I love this because this might be the only dude that I'm actually able to say, hey, do we have to go through the pleasantries on a phone call? Well, but you just got barred though because you were like, let's dispense with the pleasantries. And he's like, no, please, let's pleasant. Yeah, yeah. And it was pleasant. Uh, it was it was incredible. Um, I, I had said those phrases about four times that day. So it was great to, you know, get that fifth one in. You know, you, you, they say, oh, of course. They say you're not a polar bear in a global warming ad until you've cracked five pieces of ice. <laughs> that's gone straight over my head, but I'll let you have that one. I'll let you no have worries. that one. Well, straight over my head is a perfect uh, a perfect segue to the Chicago Bulls. And before we get into what they've done this free agency, I just want to remind you that Arturis Karnaschovas and Mark Eversley took over Who? Arturis Karnaschovas. Big Artie. Big Artie. Big Artie and Mark Eversley took over from the the hell of the Gar Pax regime that was uh, that was running the Chicago Bulls franchise just over a season ago, or was it two seasons? 
Uh, and this is, we, we talked a lot about, you know, let's build up the Chicago Bulls that say like, you know, new vision, they're going to spend some money, they're going to develop their players, they're not going to like toe the line, the treadmill of mediocrity. And this is the product, this is two years now, if I'm going to critique uh, David Griffin after having two years uh, in, in charge of a team, I can definitely critique these two for having control for two years of a team. This is the their vision for the Chicago Bulls two years on. And Dante, would you give us the particulars of what that team is? So this free agency period, I in the last few days, they signed Lonzo Ball on the first day, four-year, $85 million deal. And then they filled out the bench with Alex Caruso on a four-year, 37, and Dan Tyson on a four-year, 36. And then the coup de grace, potentially for this team's long-term future, is DeMar DeRozan uh, was acquired from the Spurs. He signed a three-year, $85 million deal, um, and it was he was acquired via sign and trade. So they sent Thad Young, Thadjik, Al Farouk Aminu, and a 2025 first-round pick back to the Spurs. Um, so that combined with the, the Vucevic trade at the trade deadline last season where they sent out two first-round picks and Wendell Carter Jr. and Aminu to, um, to the Magic, that's their team. So they've got Levine, Vucevic, Kobe White, and then these guys. That's pretty much their team. <laughs> <laughs> no one, no one wants to hear a list on a podcast anyway. That's their team for the rest of time. So they, yeah, they, that big Artie has like locked in and he said like, all right, this is a team that we're going to try and entrench ourselves as an Eastern Conference playoff uh, regular with. Yeah, well, let's let's start there. Does this team make the playoffs next season? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think this team's probably better than the Knicks. So, <laughs> yeah, this team, which puts you, well, I mean, like, if they're better than last year's Knicks and it all shakes out the same way, that puts you at the sixth seed. So they're definitely, I so they're definitely a top half of the play-in. So I think I'm seeing them like six, seven, eight seed. The top half um, of the play-in, geez. So... So let's let's just read off the east the east uh, the the top of the east. So you got Philly, Brooklyn, Milwaukee, obviously better than this team. Atlanta, their stars still rising. Miami had a really good you know really good free agency period, and they're get, they're going to bounce back from that from that bubble year. Boston, you hope that they're going to get a bounce back from the bubble year and just new coach, new everything. Washington, I really like what they've done, and we're going to talk about how they just signed Spencer Dinwiddie around uh, Bradley Beal. Indiana is like a sneaky team to bounce back. The fact that they were the non um after having quite a good year but they were missing they had a bad coach and they were missing their starting small forward charlotte's getting better charlotte charlotte had a really good draft they still have Lamelo ball they still have gordon hayward uh, and they don't have a zella which is awesome uh and then toronto just looks better as well so all those teams i could reasonably see will be better than chicago bulls just because where where the fuck's the spacing on this team like lonzo I believe in his jump shot a little bit. You are less sanguine about his jump shot. There you go. I used a Dante word. Um, you've got DeMar DeRozan, who is just a well-known black hole. A lot of pressure is going to be on Pat that, Williams to well, shoot the Well, I mean, ball. I'm, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to push back a little bit on that. That is potentially the most unfair thing that you've ever said on this podcast. Well-known when, black when the, hole. When the you? ball is out of his hands. Like, I, I was the one campaigning you to get DeMar DeRozan on the All-Star team last year because I really like the fact that he was playing the four. He was committed to playing under pop and he was like doing these you know the little things i sound like an old person but he was doing little things to help the team win and it was really exciting and i was like okay so maybe this is like what demar Rosen looks like in a modern offense obviously it was on the spurs they didn't make the playoffs and it was hardly like a, a winning machine but demar Rosen was still playing winning basketball he's still not a good catch and shoot three-point shooter he's still not a good three-point shooter uh, everything he does from behind the arc is in a small sample size, even in those years where he just has like a, a little jump up and it's like, oh, look at this. DeMar DeRozan's evolved. He's taken the jump shot. It's like, no, nah, not really. And like, he'll still, sometimes you can give him the ball and he'll just cook the crap out of like some of the best defenders in the whole entire league because he's one of those dudes that just makes shots. But when the ball's out of his hands and he's going to be on a team with Lonzo Ball, with Nikola Vucevic, and he's going to be next to Zach Levine, like still weird to think Zach Levine's actually on this team. Zach Levine and still the best player on the team you want the ball in those guys hands because i think better things happen when it's in those guys hands and other people are more likely to get a pass 
in a favorable position when it's in their hands. So I, I'm I'm not sold that Demar Derozan is going to come in and like commit to you know just being like a three and D wing that he's never done in his life. So like again, I'll go back to the original question: Where's the shooting coming from outside of Zach Levine and like maybe Vooch from those deep twos? Whoa, like that one. <laughs> um, no, that's I mean that's a fair question. That's it's it's a fair question. Um, if their starting lineup is some combination of Lonzo, Levine, DeRozan, insert player at the four. Like, I don't know who it's going to be. If they bring I back think Larry it has Markinen, to be Pat Williams. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, Larry Pat Markinen, Williams. He shoots Larry, Markinen's a rest- Larry Markinen's a restricted free agent. And as of recording, there's been no movement on a contract with him. And then, and then Vooch. I think that that's probably like middle of the road shooting because like, you, all right, if you, you, you believe Lonzo's, jump shot is for real then there's shooting Levine's a good shooter Pat Williams you hope that he comes along Vucevic is an above average shooter for a center you you know you, you get to three and a half easily and I think that initially when I saw this deal I think like like first up like no matter even if you talk yourself into the DeRozan deal the fact that they had to give up assets including a first round pick to get him. And then they're paying him almost $30 million a year. Like it's, it's an overpay. It's a, it's a <laughs> huge, massive overpay. The, the financial side of it, I just, uh, you, you can't justify it. But here's how I've kind of been thinking about it. I think DeRozan is a shout to play a lot of four with this team. And that means that you can either play Pat Williams next to him, or you can bring someone like Caruso in and play three guards because all of the guards there will have size between Levine, Lonzo and Caruso. They're like big guards. They can match up with small guards, wings, whatever. And DeRozan played a lot of four for the Spurs when they were effective last year. And he won't give you an advantage as like a stretch four because obviously he just can't shoot and he won't shoot. But the advantage that he might convey is that he's genuinely one of the best wing playmakers in the league. And if you can get, you know, like a couple of years ago, like stretch four went out of vogue and it was like, we want a playmaking four. It's like a four who can put the ball on the deck. He's big enough to match up defensively on a whole heap of different players um, and you could do a lot of a lot of fun things with cross matches to get him on a weak matchup if you needed to. And I think offensively, like he, it's going to require some creative coaching to be sure. But he has a skill set as a big scoring playmaking wing that you could use. Um, and I think Billy Donovan, maybe he's not everyone's idea of a master tactician, but he was playing with three guards in Oklahoma City with Paul Schroeder and SGA that worked really well and, you know, took a team that everyone thought was going to tank to the playoffs. So he deserves some benefit of the doubt. That's and, the uh, positive But is, is Chris Paul, is, is Zach Levine the Chris Paul in that situation? Well, I mean, if you're a, if you're in Chicago, you're saying Zach Levine was an all-star and Zach Levine is going to get better next year because he's mm. only 25 or 26 or whatever he is. I, whether that's true or not, organizationally you have Zach Levine and you're about to sign into a max contract. You can't like not be thinking that way. You yeah. Know? So that's, it's, that's the logic you have to follow, whether it's true or not. So DeMar DeRozan's birthday is the 7th of August, uh, which is two days from recording. And like he got his birthday gift like well early because he <laughs> had a meeting with the Clippers to potentially take the taxpayer MLE. The Spurs obviously didn't have any like desire to retain him and they were quickly using up all their cat space, which we'll talk about soon. And like, who the fuck were the Bulls betting against? Like if the Bulls were just like, all right, well, instead of giving you 28 mil a year, we'll give you 20 mil a year. He's not going to turn around and be like, nah, the Spurs will give me more because the Spurs aren't giving him more. And there was no other, like the Knicks have already spent up all the cat space. They spent their last $8 million on Ken Walker today. The, the only other cat space teams would be Detroit, maybe, and OKC, and neither of them are going to sign to my DeRozan. So, like, it, there, was, there was no leverage here whatsoever, apart from the fact that his birthday is soon. Uh, and now he's going to pay $28 million. And, like, let's say, let's say you're, you're um, Arturis Karnaschovas, and you're like, okay, well, let's do this because we have to do it because we, we want to retain Zach Levine. Like, we think he is a top five player in this league. We have to do everything to make him want to stay. He, he, there was a report a day before free agency where he said that he wants, quote, respect, unquote, in contract negotiations. He hasn't signed an extension yet. And even if he does sign an extension, I don't know how much I would love that extension as well. And for a dude who was, was he an all-star this year and not at all, not all, in day, all, all NBA yet? 
Yeah, or he's an, he's a, an East All Star, and it's possible that that's all that he ever amounts to. You 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 could again take the positive view and say that he has. You don't, you don't have to, Dante. <laughs> no, no, but but well, I mean, like, but but don't you though? Um, as even taking it back, if you're the if you're big Artie and you're taking it back to the trade deadline like last season, like don't even then don't you have to kind of take the positive view because you traded away. Jimmy Butler for a package of players that like hasn't really panned out except maybe for this one dude who's playing really fucking well. And like, he was a deserving East all-star. Like, you know, he wouldn't have made it in the West, but like he did deserve to be one of the, the 12 best in the East. That's, that's, that's fair. So what's the option? Cause you can't, you can't just tear it down and trade him because you're not, you're not going to get value for him because the, the, the list of teams that could possibly take him off your hands is really small. And there's other people who um, are on the market who are going to, you know, like, like there's a Beal on the market. You know, people yeah, are going to yeah, say, yeah, like, yeah. can we get Beal? We're not going to use up all of our powder on Levine. Hmm. so there's only going to be a couple of teams that would be offering you and they wouldn't be offering you the Beal Hall. They're not going to say, here's like a premium blue chip prospect and three first round picks plus salary. Like it's not happening. So yeah. your options then is either to continue being a mid-level team and they were a bad mid-level team. They were the 11 seed last year. Tear it down and trade Levine for like effectively not value, which is not an option after, you know, like years of being bad. Well, I'm not, I'm not or, even saying yeah. Levine. Uh, I, I, no, I, there, there is a middle ground and they are on the middle ground. When they traded for Vooch, they gave up those two picks. Now, that one of those picks, even after they traded for an all-star in Vucevic, an, each, an East all-star, they gave up the, the eighth overall pick. Say what you will about Mo Wagner, like still drafting someone at eight is still like good. You get a player who's top 10 in that draft. So if they just not traded for Vooch in the first place, then all of a sudden they go in, they've got Kobe White, Pat Williams, Zach Levine is older, but still like still growing, averages 27 points a game. And then you get one more piece to surround there. And then maybe you can go from there, whether that be blow it up and trade Zach Levine for pennies on the dollar, or maybe just like put all, push all your chips in and trade for someone better than Nick Vucevic. Um, and like they, they, this is this is doubling, then tripling down on the window of Levine and Vooch. And they didn't make the playoffs last year because, yeah, Zach Levine was in the health and safety protocols for like 11 days and what they were like one and nine without him. Like a, a, there was some like horrible record as soon as he sat. He didn't actually have COVID. He was just close contact. Like them's be the rules. Uh, and it's like, I just, uh, now this, this is more treadmilly than if they had done nothing. Do you agree? No, not necessarily because I just I just feel like like but like they're closer to the top now than they were before when they were like fully in the middle with no real discernible way of going either way because because if you yeah like that the assets that they had were not assets that would incentivize you to do a full tear down and like rebuild um and if they didn't trade if they didn't do the the Vucevic trade then like who what what other piece are they get, getting how are they getting that other piece and how who are they trading for that other piece because they you, you just draft them and hope that you draft right yeah but what was what was their their pick was going to be eight this year they the pick that conveyed to orlando like mm. you just hope that you draft right like well what if you don't or what if it's eight and it's a five player draft or or what like you know you you get a chance to bring in a center who's a two-time all-star I'd be more more lenient on their finish last season and say like Levine was in in protocol, but also like you're bringing in an all star who has what like 20 games to play with the franchise. You're doing it in the middle of a compressed season. There's no practice time. Like let's just be gentle and say <clears throat> that that's a difficult situation to adapt to, and that with a full off season that they'll be better. They'll come out knowing how to play together. Um, and, and I think this team, yeah, I think this team could be six, seven, eight because I think bringing in a big guard in Lonzo and a big guard in Caruso means that you have some flexibility in terms of downsizing elsewhere. And that could really suit DeRozan at the four in specific situations. Like I said before, it's going to take some creative coaching to get the most out of him because he does pose so many problems. He's kind of like what we were talking about with Westbrook the other day where he has heaps of strengths and you're like, wow, this guy's really good at this, but he has some really big problems that you need to solve for every time he's on the court. 
And unfortunately, you know, the only way around that is, is creative coaching and putting everyone in the right position. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like this is, this is you, you quibble on the detail, like you quibble on giving the two first round picks for Vucevic and for giving DeRozan almost, almost 30 million a year. Not good moves, could be better, you know, like on, on, on each individual transaction there's there's stuff to to debate but i think but big picture like like game plan i think that it's right for this this team to try and go go all in they, if it they, doesn't work they're screwed because you know like uh, if, if, if yeah i i i just have to disagree with you i honestly don't see it and i think this is a play in team uh, and the cherry on top is the fact that they gave up one of their most positive players from last year in Thaddeus Young, and um, that's no bullshit. Like they gave up one of their one of their best players in terms of just winning basketball games. Yeah, it's a it's a shit trade for DeRozan. Like, <laughs> Thad, Thad Young was a was a, a six man of the year candidate. Um, the don't let yourself get get after one season though get uh, caught in the like they're just a playing you know like team like playing team is. It, Playing team is the the seven and the eight seed. If you make it through, if you win two games in the plane, you're the seven and the eight seed. Which two years ago, that's that's fine. If you want to be, obviously that that qualifies for the treadmill of mediocrity. But if you've missed the playoffs for four years after trading your all star wing, and you want to like let's you want to say like let's just be the seven seed for a season, and then next season we'll try and be the fifth seed, and we'll try and be better, and we'll try and win fifty games. Like that's that logic to me checks out. It's if you go seven, 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 then obviously that's a problem. And if you make the plane as a strong seven, eight seed, like a top seeded playing team, like it's the same as as long as you win those games, it's the same as just being a playoff team, you know. So I think that if you aim for seven, like and try and consolidate. Levine's getting better. Like, you think Lonzo's getting better. Caruso's still young, maybe in a different role. He can expand and show things he didn't. You know, I'm just trying to put on my positive cap. But... All right. All right. Well, Should we move on to Miami? Yeah, let, let's keep your positive cap on and, and tell us what Miami did this offseason. So, the big ticket is that they signed Kyle Lowry to a $90 million deal over three years. That was in a sign and trade. So Goran Dragic and Precious Achua going back to Toronto. Duncan Robinson re-signed on the biggest contract ever signed by an undrafted player, which was $90 million over five years. They brought in PJ Tucker on a two-year $15 million deal. And then they brought in Dwayne Dedman, Markeith Morris on vet minimums. And they re-signed Vic Oladipo on a one-year vet minimum. Hang on, they re-signed Victor Oladipo on a one-year vet minimum. Hasn't he turned down a lot of money in the past two years? Whoa, that's so funny that you asked that, Sean, <laughs> because last season, Houston offered him a $45 million deal over two years, and mm. the season before, he turned down $112 million over four years from the Indiana Pacers. This is and all some, I this have is to some say 60 is, chess. <laughs> all I have to say is that this cunt has got it so fucking wrong. He has got it so <laughs> wrong. He's got it more wrong than anyone I've ever seen. You, you know, when you go on YouTube, now I'm speaking to the listeners here, not Dante, because he doesn't go on YouTube, and you'll just, they'll, you'll pop up with like investment advice just from some random dude with like uh, a really tight fade, and he's wearing a suit with a bow tie, and he's like, invest in this stock and you'll be rich. If Victor Oladipo ever tells you to do anything with your money, fucking run in the other direction. <laughs> Um, I think I think we're going to disagree on the Miami Heat a bit here. Um, so you let, let's start off with Kyle Lowry. Do you like the Kyle Lowry sign and trade? Yeah, I do like the Kyle Lowry. Right. So do I. So do I. I think like where are Miami going? Right, this money was clearly reserved for Giannis Antetokounmpo. He happened to re-sign and win a championship with his team. But like in terms of the Miami Heat, they cleared all this cat space. They signed all these contracts to eventually expire this offseason. This is like to get the best player in free agency still, even though he's not the one dude that you want. Like that's fine. Like I, I think this is this will be a bad deal at the end of the contract. But then again, like everyone said that Chris Paul was going to be a bad deal at the end of the contract. And uh, he still might be a bad deal at the end of his, his newest contract. But like, this is fine. I think they did good. They did a good job at getting the best player in free agency. Uh, what do you think about Duncan Robinson and PJ Tucker? I think with Robinson, you have to do it because he has a skill that's that truly like not replaceable. 
you can sign Wayne Ellington on a vet min, but it's not the same as having like the Duncan Robinson running around screens. And he just like, he's the, he's the key that just unlocks so much of what their offense does. And obviously they're signing all of these big deals. They extended Jimmy Butler on like a, you know, like a four year max $700 million deal as well. So they've <laughs> locked him in. They're going to give Bam. <clears throat> have they already given Bam? No, they, if they haven't. They're going to. No, they have. They, they, they did last off season because remember how Bam could have waited a bit. I um, mean, he's got the yeah, same agent yeah, as Giannis. Yeah. And they said, oh, you know what? Maybe I'm hearing things. I might just try and get my money now instead of um, just being thrown aside for Kawhi Leonard, for example, the following offseason. Yeah, so they're they're clearly prepared to go right up to the tax apron, which is like the maximum amount of money that a team possibly can pay. Like you, you don't get any more than that. Um, it, it'll it'll push them right up against it. But oh, they, they, they actually, they they actually been... are. They actually are at the hard cap, so they had to like let. That's a I can't remember who. They had to like. Oh, Kendrick Nunn. They had to pull back on their qualifying offer because if Kendrick Nunn had just signed his qualifying offer, they would legally not be able to do it. So everyone from here on out is all on a on a minimum contract. Yeah, um, and I mean they've they've shown an ability before to kind of like untangle disentangle themselves from messy cap situation so they'll be able to do it again but i am quite bullish on like a lowry robinson hero butler bam and role players vibe and i think that hero has a little bit of like third year jason tatum potential not to be i don't think he'll be that good but you know the the career arc through their first two years is almost identical in that they were like good but not great as rookies and then they really just like ascended in their postseason um where a large in their first postseason a large part of propelling their teams to the 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 conference finals and the finals respectively and then had disappointing second years and you know tatum just came back and was just like an absolute monster Mm. um in his third year so if hero is even you know like just if he's just better than what he was in his second year that's another like young cost control player who you've got um you know for the next two years and that they can they don't have to extend him early they can just like ride him through to the the Mm. end and like let him get to restricted free agency Mm. Uh, which will which will mean that they don't have to they can get two seasons like this season and next season with like just this um collection of contracts which mm. will obviously be just under the hard cap so i'm pretty bullish on that team i don't think that that team's going to be brooklyn but you know like uh, i think that team could easily be a top four seed and you've got to be in it to win it so i think that that's probably i, I like what they've done the only one that i would quibble with his pj tucker i just like what like i've seen pj tucker in the playoffs uh, you know a month ago and he was genuinely doing nothing and people were like yeah he defended durant in the conference and i was like yeah did you fucking watch it he defended durant the game when durant had the best fucking postseason game anyone's ever seen outside um, of the golden state warriors yeah I'll question that <laughs> um yeah, he's he's yeah. I just feel like he's he's lost two steps, so he's very very slow and limited in his matchup flexibility. And you had the you had the call, you know, like ages ago about his he, even his corner jump shot. He pulls his arm back like he's a fucking trebuchet and just like launches <laughs> it because he just looks like he doesn't have the strength to get it. This mm. bloke is like a walking one point eight points per game average. <laughs> um, and you're it's giving me, him seven it's and a me half- at Coburg, <laughs> a walking one point eight. <laughs> <laughs> you're giving him seven and a half million dollars for the next two years. Like you mm. just could have, you've seen what players are prepared to take, like smaller deals. Like, would you have rather had PJ Tucker on two years fifteen or Kendrick Nunn on two years ten and signed another role player as a you know, a, a Tucker facsimile on a, a minimum. I would probably take the second one. Mm. I I look so I I don't really agree with your optimism on Tyler Hero. Uh, he's got real Logan Paul vibes to me, and I'm really just not a fan. <laughs> I actually like Tyler Hero as a trade piece for this team because now they've got matching salaries to send out the wazoo. So if you want to send a salary plus Tyler Hero and someone else falls in love with it, then I love that for the Miami Heat. Um, but yeah, I don't mind the PJ Tucker contract. I also know that for the last five years, he's just been bitching in Houston saying he wants to get more money. Um, and I also love the fact that he went to Miami because they offered him $5 million more million than the Milwaukee Bucks. 
This is the same Bucks who said that, hey, Giannis, we're ready to commit to paying the tax to get you to win a team. Imagine if the Bucks still had Malcolm Brogdon, but then they go out and they try and sign uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich. Obviously, some some stuff went down there. But then they go out and they they pay for Drew Holiday. They pay the price it is. They win a title. They say, look, Giannis, we're here. All the fucking creepy little dudes. You get the trophy before the players. You actually got it. And they're like, look, we're here. We're committed to that Milwaukee. Was crazy. <laughs> we're, qu- we're committed to the Bucks. We're here. We're here. We're here to win. And then they try to skimp out and save money on PJ Tucker. How are they going to replace him? They're right up against the hard cap. They can't. So I fucking, I really hope, uh, let me just go to Milwaukee's cap sheet. I really hope Bobby Portis learns how to defend like PJ Tucker. Or I don't know, do you like Jordan Noir or Sam Merrill or Axel Tupain? Because that's their fucking backup option. If they don't want to re-sign PJ Tucker because they were cheaping out, that's their backup option. Guys that are still on their roster and minimums, and you're not going to get anyone. You might not, you might not like PJ Tucker, but compared to someone on the minimum, he's worlds better. Uh, and fuck you, fucking Milwaukee for I pronounce their name wrong all the time, but fuck you, fuck the buck, man. This is really fucking annoying. <laughs> fuck and, the buck. And good, like yeah, maybe it's a bit much for PJ Tucker this late in his career, but for fuck's sakes, at least they paid him, and at least the Heat are sitting there like you know you know what, we didn't get Giannis, but let's just try and win. Like you said, get in the competition, get in the top four. Maybe something magical happens and maybe there's another pandemic and just because Jimmy Butler's on your team, you're going to make it all the way to the finals. But they fucking paid PJ because they want to win games and the fucking Bucks didn't. It's so frustrating and it's going to get underreported and it's going to get under talked about it because now they've won the title, they're done. Like they, they could just go out in the first round for the next four years of Giannis's contract because he's locked up. There's no pressure from Giannis for them to keep winning. And it might be toxic that LeBron and Kawhi and all these dudes to get those one plus one deals and Kevin Durant, but you do it so you don't get fucking stagnant owners who are like, oh, maybe we don't have to pay the tax or maybe we don't have to pay a little bit more money and fuck the bucks. This is such a sour taste after winning a title. And it's, oh, fuck me, man. I'm, I'm annoyed. Just the, this podcast is getting a little E next to its name. Yeah, definite E, but I can get behind and fuck the buck. That's oh. just a personal thing for me. <laughs> um, Why don't I? I don't want to talk about it. There's steam. Um, There's steam on my on my camera. Are you seeing that? Yeah, you're hated. You're hated. Anyway, Victor um, Oladipo is good value for fucking peanuts, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, the bucks, the bucks should have, the bucks should have uh, ponied up. I don't or, like or it. Deered up. Deered up deared up mm, wow yeah. i don't like it for i don't like the, the tucker signing for for the hate just because i feel like it's rich and there's better options but yes you win a title and a role player comes up for the thing and you've made all these promises like we're gonna fucking you know um commit like all right i get it i get the i get the the negative energy here um let's let's move on to the ladies <laughs> who, imagine if the box we talked about at length Imagine if the Bucks kept frogs in. <laughs> um, that should be like our, it should be like the deep two, like the D2 podcast, the D2 NBA podcast. Like, and then it's like the sub, the sub head. Like, Imagine <laughs> if the Bucks kept frogs in. All right. So we talked about the Lakers. Uh, obviously, they shook the foundations of the NBA with the blockbuster trade on Drat. You know, a trader for Russell Westbrook. <laughs> down. Hey, did they get a former MVP and all NBA player? Oh, you fucking know they did. You fucking know they did. We were over the moon when we first heard that the NBA was going to be televised on Australian free-to-air TV in the 2019-20 season. It didn't exactly go swimmingly with the nasty cough halting the season and games getting cancelled left, right and centre, but it was a huge step and an exciting one for basketball fans all across the country. Better yet, it wasn't a commercial channel cashing in on some basketball nerds like us. It was SBS, one of our public broadcasters. Unfortunately, the NBA wasn't the only thing SBS was pushing last season. They also ran advertisements from Sportsbet, Ladbroke, Bet365, BetEasy and Neds, some of the biggest sports betting companies in Australia. In a one step forwards, two steps backwards move, SBS has dropped the ball here. As a public broadcaster, SBS plays a key role in providing relevant, culturally appropriate health information to local communities. The last thing SBS should be doing is offering a platform for gambling companies during the most financially unstable time in recent memory. This past year, men aged 18 to 24 made up 79% of new gambling account holders with increased median spending and frequency of bets. This is the last thing we should be spending our money on given the financial uncertainty that comes with the pandemic. 
During COVID lockdowns, wagering companies spent more money on advertising and incentives to gamble, and it worked. SBS needs to hear from viewers that gambling ad revenue isn't worth the harm it causes. Call on the SBS chair, George Savitas, to put community health ahead of gambling revenue by signing the petition at www.endgamblingads.org.au forward slash get gambling off SBS with hyphens in between. All right, so we talked about it. No one can shoot. What are they going to do? How are they going to fix this? All right. Here's how they've fixed it. Here's how (laughs) Rob Palinka and the GM have fixed it. Taylor Horton Tucker, they bring him back on a three-year, $32 million deal. They bring in the aforementioned Kendrick Nunn on two years, 10. And then they bring in Mello, Trevor Ariza, Wayne Allington, Dwight Howard, Kent Bazemore, and Malik Monk, all on vet minimums. Malik Monk is less of a vet than the others, (laughs) so his vet minimum is He's more minimum than vet. (laughs) Here's my, I'm going to give, I'm going to give like a cliff notes um, rundown of all of the guys that they signed. All right. Can't shoot, can't shoot, washed, washed, can't do anything but shoot, Dwight, can't shoot. Eh. <laughs> yeah. Did you see LeBron's tweet today? I did say LeBron needs to shut the fuck up and stop. <laughs> LeBron, I, I, I was looking for it before and I couldn't find it. LeBron tweeted something. That he deleted was like, it. He deleled it. I've got it yeah. right in front of me. Do you want me to read it out to you? Please read it. So just for just to preface it, the person who who screenshotted this tweet and put it on Reddit uh, is with Belong. So I think it's pretty cute that, I think that's just in Australia, that someone from Australia actually uh, tweeted it. That screenshot of the tweet, but quote, keep talking about my squad, our personnel ages and the way they play. We're past our prime in this league, ETC, ETC, ETC. Uh, he borrowed a little thing from Marco Sace there. Uh, do me one favor, please. And I mean, please keep that same narrative energy when it begins. That's all I ask. Hashtag thank you, crown emoji. Um, yeah. All right. So, Dante, you shut, uh... shut up, bro. <laughs> like, you literally, what are you talking about? Stop acting <laughs> like your team, like your, your, your personnel decisions are like unimpeachable, that it's terrible <laughs> that. People are saying that a team that's going to rely on Wayne Ellington to be their best shooter is going to is going to potentially struggle. And stop acting like the media is always against you. Before you got injured last season, <laughs> thirty games into the season, the media was propping you up as the fucking MVP candidate and talking about how good you are and how great you are. Like, come on, bro. Like, stop manufacturing this trite like them against us narrative you're literally the fucking los angeles lakers you know anyway <laughs> that's just- I, I mean he knows his market so you know there's a million lakers fans out there who saw that and were like yeah yeah Aries is old but maybe he maybe he knows something about the game of basketball and i mean <laughs> the last time Melo was put in an actual title contention situation yeah he, he got dumped from houston but maybe this is the time like maybe his destiny isn't just a middling playoff team like portland i mean like it's fine on portland but portland don't have title aspirations dwight howard's good um this is the third time over kent Bazemore, i was over the moon as a warriors fan when i saw he signed with someone else <laughs> um I, I like malik monk uh you, you've written down here air but i i like him uh i like um a fifth year player getting a vet minimum that's that's always a positive sign but I don't know if he if he can if he can walk chew gum and hit threes when LeBron finds them wide open to him like he's going to get marginally paid in, in his next contract. The only thing with Malik Monk is that he's played four years and he's only had one good shooting season. Oh um, no, and- you missed a joke there. <laughs> he's played for five seasons and he's only had one game. That was fifty points against North Carolina. <laughs> what what part of that is funny? Oh, Mr. Boffer. We both had angry free agency sections, all right, but let's <laughs> just pretend to laugh. No, and I can't take any I can't take any slander of the of the Tar Heels. Oh, Although he yeah. did, oh, he, that's did your, oh. he did go he did go for 50. So he's had one season where he shot above 34 from three. Um Horton Tucker is another dude like that who, like, in theory, cool, he can shoot, but, like, functionally, I'm not 100% sure. Wayne Ellington, obviously, Wayne Ellington can shoot. It's just that he can't do anything else. So you're putting him on and you're 
offering, you know, you're creating a chink in your defensive armor and you're saying like, all right, well, we're going to not be as good defensively. We're not going to be as good on the boards. He can't fucking do anything offensively. He's not a screen setter. He can't dribble. He can't finish inside. So it's all these dudes who have like, you're like, yeah, we need shooting. And then you bring in Ellington and Monk. And Monk's another one who's like very, very limited skill set on both ends of the court. He can do a little bit more off the bounce than than Ellington none he can really slash and get inside like Horton Tucker but he can't shoot and it's just like where's like have you got any role player who can do two things or have you just got a bunch of role players who are great and who the you know like you plug someone in at the two and then the person that you plug in at the three needs to be someone who can solve the problem that your two guard presents and so on and so forth into eternity yeah um so they haven't re-signed Dennis Schroeder they haven't re-signed Wesley Matthews or Jared Dudley. Uh, Marcus Ole will be playing on this team. He said that after Spain were eliminated, he will be playing for the Lakers as he is under contract. Um, yeah, so out of that, you do have one role player that can do two things. It's Marcus Ole. Um, He's obviously getting old and can't do it that much anymore. And I, I just, I, I'm so... Uh, obviously, this Lakers team is going to be a very toxic environment because you've got Westbrook stands and you've got Lakers fans. And Dante, I'm glad you're not on Twitter because it's going to be a fucking hellscape next season. But just sprinkle in a little bit of Kent Bazemore into that situation who, for some reason, just tweets at random people like, all right, yeah, you tuck your shirt in while you're on the bench. But uh, I don't know if that gives you a right just to be like, hey, Bradley Beal, like, stop fussing or whatever. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and... Over under 0.5 championships for the Los Angeles Lakers while LeBron is still in the league. Under. Yeah, I think definitely under. I, I can't see this team competing for a title. I can see them competing. Uh, you, tell mate, me, you, tell me, you tell me this team's a three seed and I'm like, yeah, all right, I believe you, 100%. And, you know, like we just talked about with Miami, like you, you, you're, if you're up there, you've got a chance, Right. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not taking this team against, you know, any of the other contenders. Uh, yeah, it's just like next year is going to be harder than this year because you'll have the Warriors will be back maybe by the playoffs. Are they? Yeah, yeah, the Warriors are back, mate. Okay. Um, did you, Did you watch Summer League today? Did you watch no, Moses, Moses see, Moody and, and Kaminga come in? I did see. I did see Kaminga have a teammate wide open for a lob on the fast break and instead just decide to just go into oncoming traffic he made the basket but i was like oh like everything they said about this dude is true <laughs> you know what they say results not process <laughs> um everyone's just getting better we just talked about the ease before everyone's a little bit better uh, the Clippers are, are without Kawhi, but Dallas got better. Denver, if Jamal Murray can actually play and be 100% by the playoffs, they're a title contender. Uh, the Memphis Grizzlies got a little bit worse. The Pelicans eventually have to make the playoffs. Um, Adam Silver will have a fit if, you, if they don't. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like everything's just a little bit harder and uh, you're not in the bubble anymore. Well, and the team's not as good. Like, do we yeah. think that this team's better than the team? Like. I, I don't know. This team last season was first in the West before LeBron got hurt. Mm. So LeBron was going to be the MVP. They were first in the West. So like, do we think this team is better than th what they were a year ago? I'd probably skew, probably not. So, we always we always say on this podcast, don't we say don't count LeBron out, and we also say don't don't count out Greg Greg Popovich until they actually finally get counted out, uh, and. Last year, you say, yes, asterisk this, asterisk that, you know, LeBron's injured, AD's injured. But this was the first time that LeBron hasn't done it, you know. this And it was injuries, but it was the first time. We can no longer say that it's, you know, unimpeachable 100%. LeBron's going to be there all the yeah, time. No, yeah. not, not counting him out by any stretch. Just saying that Russell Westbrook's probably not the answer. That's, that's what the comment is. Oh, no, I, no I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, well, let's move on to one of the more interesting teams in the league. I mean, I, I, I can't believe you don't want to say anything about this team, but the San Antonio Spurs, may, maybe I'm too close to the situation because my housemate's a Spurs fan. Um, but what did they do this offseason? They signed Doug McDermott to a three-year, $42 million deal. 
Zach Collins, three years, 22. Uh, they signed Jock Landale, uh, Australian legend, after this incredible run for the bronze medal <laughs> to a two-year deal. They just got away with highway freaking robbery for DeMar DeRozan. Uh, they got, as we mentioned before, Thad Young, El Farouk Aminu, and a first, which could be a good first. Uh, and they drafted Josh Primo. I just think that this is nice that the Spurs are actually doing things. Um, and as I keep saying to friend of the pod, Jackson, the magic number is 34 here because... I, I was worried that the Spurs were going to be like, okay, let's just draft someone who's like more ready now. Maybe they draft that, who's that Indiana dude, um, Chris Duarte. Maybe they just like go for it right now because the magic number is 34 because that's how many wins away Greg Popovich is from the all-time uh, coaching wins leader, right? Behind uh, Don Nelson, hashtag Dub Nation. Um, so I, I really want this team to be semi-competitive, maybe even sniff the play in just to get 34. And then uh, is Pop going to retire at the end of the season or has he got two more seasons? Uh, and then, you know, then the Spurs will be in this new era where, you know, this new era led by Kelvin Johnson, Josh Primo, Josh Primo who was projected to go 26 to Denver and end up going 12. I mean, that's a little bit questionable, but Dante, you know all about drafting dudes a little too early. I, I really like what the Spurs did. They were a horrible shooting team last year. They got Doug McDermott. They got Josh Primo, who, if anything, he can shoot. Hey, Dante, remember that last time someone got overdrafted? And if anything they could do to shoot, it's Cam Johnson. Uh, and they also drafted Joe Wisecam in the second round. And you never want to count on a second round pick. I probably just gave up my take <laughs> right there, but he can really shoot the ball. Um, and just like, if DeRozan walked, I would have been happy. But DeRozan walked. They got Thad Young, who's extremely tradable. And a first in 2025 when Zach Levine could be wearing another jersey instead of the Chicago Bulls. Well, I think that this team is, I think the Bulls are better than this team. That like, These guys are worse than the Bulls. I yeah. I don't even yeah, yeah. think that it's, I don't even think it's close. So what, like 35 is like in the West, what, like 10, probably not 10, maybe like 11? 30, 11 uh, I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the standings now. It's hard to see because obviously you had the, yeah, the, yeah. the so I'll go. All right. So the 2019-20. Also spicy cough shortened far out. The 2018-19. <laughs> uh, so in 2018-19, the Memphis Grizzlies won 33 games, tied with the Pelicans. So that was that was Jar's rookie season, yeah. And and what seed were they? Oh uh, no, it wasn't Jar. It wasn't Jar's rookie season. So Memphis Grizzlies got 33 wins, and they were 11th in the West, and that's okay, before so Jar. So then the Spurs need to be an 11 seed for Pop to get get to the big one and overtake uh, Donny Nelson. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's sick. But <laughs> Doug McDermott is good. Doug, Doug McDermott is good. Zach Collins is not going to play because he's going to get injured again. And the fifth name that you mentioned was Joe Wieskamp, who's a second-round pick. Wieskamp. Fucking learn it. Wieskamp. Right. Shades of Justinian um, Jessup. Shades of Justinian Jessup, the second coming. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm. Oh, hang on, hang on. Not, I've counted wrong. It's twenty four. So Don Nelson has one thousand three hundred thirty five, and Pop has one thousand three hundred ten. I've yeah. counted wrong. That that's much more achievable. Oh, oh well, they can definitely do that. I think that's amazing news. Hundred percent, no stress. Jock Landale is going to average eighteen and ten. So like they've got the center <laughs> of the future. Yeah, um, might be a little bit weak, but he's definitely mobile. All right, let's move on because no one wants to hear about that. Uh, the Washington Wizards got their point guard in Spencer Dinwiddie. Uh, they signed him into a three-year, $62 million deal. And no, the Lakers didn't give up the assets in Kyle Kuzma and Montrose Hall to reroute them to Brooklyn to make the space. It was the San Antonio Spurs who came in uh, and uh, alleviated a bit of cap from the Washington Wizards, taking on Chandler Hutchinson and a 2022 second rounder for their trouble. That 2022 second rounder is the best out of some team, another team, and the Detroit Pistons. They could get <laughs> the Detroit Pistons 2022 second round pick, which is should be a top 10 second round pick. Should be a fucking great pick and just all, all for rocking up. <laughs> it's incredible uh, and also uh, also because the Lakers didn't want to trade these pieces to the Nets and make another title contender better but uh, what do you think about the actual deal which I've, I've clearly glossed over what do you think about Spencer Dinwiddie heading to the Wizards on roughly 20 million a year I think the contract's too rich yeah I, I'm definitely hiring Dinwiddie we spoke about that last week I, I think 
the I think the contract is well put. I, I like the number. Um, where do you like the Wizards as a whole where they are right now? Um, I mean, we've seen what a great like a vintage Beal season and a bunch of role players looks like before. That's what we saw two years ago when Wall set out, and they weren't particularly good. And they were bad enough that the front office said, "Fuck, we've got to fucking do something. Let's tra- let's trade for let's trade for Russ and try and shake things up." Um, so I'm not particularly optimistic, especially because they've got a bunch of that like, young players who have shown some things, but not enough for you to like say, "Okay, I'm really confident that Rui Hachimura is going to be really good this season." Same with Denny Avdia. Thomas Bryant showed that he was one of the best and most well-rounded offensive big men in the league. Not the same on the defensive side of the court, but he's going to probably miss miss at least the start of the season um, coming back off of a torn ACL. So they've kind of got young guys who in theory, they're all top 10 picks and you're like, yeah, like third year, second year, like they're going to take the step. But I just am not 100% convinced that they will. And Dinwiddie, Dimri himself, when we talked about it last week, I I used to be a big fan, but the the lack of the lack of scoring ability, lack of effective scoring ability, um, kind of irks me a little bit. And if you're going to be paying a point guard twenty million dollars a year, you want him to be able to like finish at the rim, hit threes, and do like regular point guard stuff. And he can probably only get you one and a half of those three vital things. I I. Sp- I just disagree with that analysis. I think Spencer Dinwiddie is an effective player. Um, I don't think he's one of the best point guards. I don't think he's one of the worst. Uh, I just, I think he's good. Uh, And sadly, we're a year removed from him being good. So there is, you know, there is a tiny bit of like cause, cause for concern from my point of view, just because you haven't seen him for a year and how's he going to return from injury. But like he's returned from plenty of injuries in his past and he's he's been fine. Um, I, this is, if anything, my favorite NBA 2K team. I think they've just got mm. so many pieces. You know, you love playing with Gafford. You love playing with Thomas Bryant. You love playing with Montrose Harrell. You've got matching salaries. And this obviously applies to real life, that like all 2K comments. Um, you've got just tradable pieces. So there's there's a lot of assets here that maybe they could throw in, push all the chips in and get something. Like if someone offers you, like if, if you want to give someone Montrose Harrell, uh, Denny, Rui, Corey Kispert, pick your favorite two out of them. You can like easily cobble together some like a pretty substantial salary. You've got a couple of things there. You've also got a couple of picks incoming uh, and outgoing actually. So it's like, I think there's, there's a potential for another move here. And I, I actually don't know if they're going to start the season with three centers on their roster. So maybe we see one of these moves earlier, but um, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the situation. And, and you mentioned two years ago, the Bradley Beal thing and just a team built around Bradley Beal. I much prefer out of all like this Washington wizards, let's build around Bradley Beal team. This is by far my favorite with Spencer Dinwiddie, Beal, KCP, Davis Bertans and three quality centers. Um, and obviously Daniel Gafford, a cult hero among Australian podcast basketball podcasters, um, and God Montrez, like you know, you're in you're in a te- a team that's not trying to win a title. Go for the Sixth Man of the Year award again, like that's so much fun. Um, and if you like power forwards, we've got power forwards out the wazoo with Kyle Kuzma. I haven't even mentioned Kyle Kuzma, and then Denny Rui and Corey Kispert and your mate Anthony Jill. We we talked about this last pod. I just really like their situation. They've just got a lot of dudes, and I, I love Aaron Holiday as well. I think he's actually really good. Um, excuse me for not watching Indiana games down the end of the seasons, though. I do agree that they are in a good position. Uh, going into the season to be a, a team that swings a trade. And I would say KCP is probably their like, most obvious trade candidate because we talked about it last week. There's going to be a playoff team down the stretch at the trade deadline that just needs a big experienced wing who can defend and, sh- and hit threes and KCP fits that bill exactly. So they'll be able to get something, you know, an asset, a young player, a pick, whatever. Harrell, I mean, like a team trading for Harrell is going to be trading, you know, a team trading for that kind of player is going to be trading for him with like the, like bolster the bench before going into the playoffs. And we've just obviously mm. seen what happens with Harrell. I, I, th- I think so the I team, th- I think the team trading for Harrell is someone who doesn't care about the later stages of the playoffs and just wants to get into the playoffs maybe. 
Yeah, potentially. And I think that there'll be enough interest in Kuz if he actually sees the court, but that they're probably going to be more invested in giving those wing and big four minutes to uh, Denny and Rui because, you know, they're the homegrown guys and you kind of need them <laughs> to be good if you're going to have any credibility as being someone who can draft. Um, so I think that there's a chance that the, the Kuz could kind of find himself on the outside looking in. Of course, there'll always be a Sacramento Kings trade ready to go for Kuz, so you can just hit send <laughs> on that at any at any time. It seems like I think that yeah, they're. Uh, I mean, in terms of an, an asset play, they're in a better place than where they were last year, and like they've had Gafford emerge as you know as a promising center, and they've got options. But I just think in terms of the team, I'm not like over the moon about it. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. We'll just have to agree to disagree and move into the season with it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's just let's just, hit the just last... like the Philadelphia 76ers and Ben Simmons. That's that's not a segue. We're not talking about that again. Let's hit the last. And ben team. Simmons hits a three. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about let's talk about the uh, the Pelicans. Who I'm giving um, I'm awarding them the inaugural uh, Victor Oladipo fucked it up the most award um, because they fully fucked it. You wrote a piece about how shit. David Griffin is as an NBA GM and how he should be let go, uh, which which you can uh, listeners you can read that on the deep two dot com. He should he should be parted ways with. I think I would. He should be parted ways <laughs> with. Yeah, <laughs> um, and somehow he just was like, yeah, I'm gonna take that and be better. But then he just ended up making the worst decisions. So, in terms of transactions, it's. Um, it's a little bit light on. So I'll just run you through the thought process or the seeming thought process behind all of Griffin's moves. So he's like, we're just going to let Lonzo walk. They get Thomas Sadoransky and Garrett Temple and a second round pick back, which is fine, whatever. Temple is a role player. Sado can be your backup point. Prior to that, they traded a first round pick along with Bledsoe and Adams to clear space to sign Kyle Lowry. Who then, if you are, if you listen to the first half an hour of the pod, you may know that Lowry is actually playing for <laughs> Miami next season. And what's more, Lowry signed for Miami so quickly that it was obvious that the Pelicans never even had a chance at signing him. So they traded these contracts to clear space. They attached a pick to do it. The dude that they didn't. The dude that they wanted didn't come. And then they were like, all right, let's pivot. So they traded a first round pick in a sign and trade to the Hornets for Devontae Graham, who signed a four year, $47 million deal. So now their backcourt is Sado and Devontae Graham. And, and Nikhil Alexander two, Walker and Trey Murphy. And they, and they traded two first round picks and let Lonzo go so that their backcourt could be Sado and Devontae Graham. Yeah, it's that's why they that's why they're this week's Victor Oladipo <laughs> fucked it up the most award winner. <laughs> Do you cry because you're sad or are you sad because you cry? <laughs> Crying isn't all the game, it's the entire game. <laughs> oh Michelob Ultra chat. We love it. We love it. Mich- Dude, Michelob I saw Ultra also secretly like not a real beer. It's actually it's actually a fucking pyramid scheme because you can't buy it anywhere. I I you was Google, I was you Google uh, uh, buy Michelob Ultra uh, and the first beer that comes up is not Michelob Ultra. No, anyway, it's that's a good don't say. <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> sus. But I was watching some, I was watching something. I wish I remembered it, what it was. But then, you know, like, you know, the cloak, we were like, oh, you know, you know, don't tell you after a couple of beers. It's like, oh, he's a bit funny, right? You know, just that. Someone said to someone in some, maybe it was YouTube. And they, instead of saying, oh, him after a few beers, it was like, oh yeah, get him after a few Mickey B's and you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Mickey I did B's. not just hear that. Mickey, Mickey B's. B's. I, th- it just wants me to have them even more, but they literally don't import to Australia. Oh yeah, as Dante said, they don't exist at all. This is fucking... <sighs> so 
David Griffin must have the fastest negotiating skills in the West, right? Now that's a pun because just the minute that free agency opened, he was able to so quickly negotiate a sign and trade with Lonzo Ball to the Chicago Bulls. I was dumbfounded. Like, because obviously you're not allowed to talk with teams or agents before actual Yeah, 6 I think they've got a word for that. Yeah, tampering. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know how he negotiated that deal so fast to get rid of his young up and coming point guard, then somehow missed the boat by a day on the best point guard on the market. And then even after you've missed the best point guard, the whole thing about this year's free agency is that there's a lot of point guards out there. You know, we've talked about Spencer Dinwiddie. Um, what's his name was a free agent. Uh, blah, 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 Mike Conley, um, Devontae Graham. Yeah. He was also a free agent, but he's maybe like the fifth, sixth, seventh best player out there. Eight, uh, nine. <laughs> um, no, nah, I, I I like him. Um, I had him on fantasy, so you know I've got a little soft spot for him. But this this is your big move. You dump the tenth pick with Bledsoe and Adams to get seventeen and Trey Murphy the third for Devonte Graham, and it's like what what are what are we doing here? Um, and is this to appease? I mean, sorry, you also got Garrett Temple. Is this to appease Zion Williamson? Does Zion Williamson love Devonte Graham? Like I, I haven't heard of it yet. Uh, and it, it's they a do fine share contract. An agent. Oh, they do share an agent, oh. but the the pick the pick. So they they traded the tenth pick to the Grizz prior to the draft, and the pick that they sent to the Hornets wasn't one of the early Lakers picks, which will probably end up being you know like a bad pick. They sent oh, their own. Hey, hold on, hold protected. on, Dante. <laughs> We've seen what the Lakers have. Nah, go on, go on. They sent their own lottery protected. <laughs> they sent their own. They sent. They sent their own lottery protected 2022 pick to the Hornets for Graham. So if it if it if it pays off and Graham, you know, averages 50 points and the, the Pelicans make the playoffs, <laughs> then that pick is probably going to be like the 17th pick. So you've effectively traded the 17th and the 10th picks for Devontae Graham. But why why'd they have to why'd they have to make it a sign and trade? They they cleared the space. To sign a max contract, max ish, right? They've cleared the space mm. and then they signed Devontae Graham to roughly 10 million a year. You know why, Sean? Because oh. they fucked it. Because they fucked it. Because they fully fucked it. This is so, and I I want New Orleans and all these small markets to play well and do good things, uh, but then they do bad things and it makes me upset. Cough, cough, yeah. Milwaukee box. Yeah. I'm, I'm out on Graham as well. Um, you're in a lot I, of dudes. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm in my old age. I'm becoming crabby and cynical. Um, no, I'll give you. I'll give you a number for Devonte Graham. Yeah, one of his shooting percentages, and that shooting percentage is forty-one. And before you ask, before you say, oh, he's a laser from, from behind pretty, the eye. <laughs> forty-one from three is pretty good. That's actually his shooting percentage at the rim. So <laughs> yeah, call me old-fashioned, Sean, but I like my point guards to be able to do anything except shoot threes well like um, small guards don't age well um and he's 26 so you know he's getting up there <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah i, I just it's just it's just crazy how how poorly uh they the pelicans have played their hand here they've 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 pissed away first round picks to open up space for and i just think the most galling thing that must be the fact that like Lowry obviously would have T-worded with the Heat and had a conversation about it before free agency opened because he signed that quickly. And it's like, for David Griffin to do all this stuff to open up space for Lowry, who most likely never even thought about going to the Pelicans, like, come on, that's some fucking, that's some beta. That is some beta GM moves there. <laughs> uh i think let me let me just hold on to that thing that you just said because i think there was a report to save face uh oh no yes the save face report was chris paul entertained a 300 million dollar from offer from the pelicans that was the saving face you so you just said cole Airy didn't even think about going there the fucking the report was that chris paul thought about it and it's like, oh, hang on, they're in the conversation here. It's it's so upsetting. That it's, report would have come, that report would have been leaked to the journalist after Lowry had signed and it would have been Griff being like, oh, fuck, like I got to do something. Like leak, 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 leak. Yeah. <sighs> um, it's, it's just entitled because if this was any other team and all they had was their own first round picks, those 
those those assets are in such like there's there's not many of them but because there's the lakers trade because there was the milwaukee trade they've got all these assets they've got all these first round picks that he can just piss away and the fucking worst entitled thing about it is that new orleans could full well make the playoffs next year just because zion is so good at basketball and i believe in him so much i mean they're gonna make the playoffs because i believe in him but there's like they could they could still do well just because they have good talent but they just didn't maximize the talent yeah, well, I mean, uh, Zion might be looking at this though and thinking like, what a clusterfuck, which means if they do well, he's not going to be like, wow, we made the playoffs. He's going to be like, do I trust this front office to take us to the next the next level? Mm. Potentially not. Fire David Griffin. Fire him. <laughs> uh, Part right. ways with him. <laughs> Part ways with my mans right now. All right. Two more pieces of news. Uh, first one is Steph Curry had a beautiful little puff piece with Marcus Thompson of The Athletic and I lapped it the fuck up. Uh, he had some quotes in there saying like, yep, you know, I, I love the draft fix. I love the, the way that we're going with these two windows. Um, I think Steph would fucking be pleased with anything. They're going to be paying him at least $53 million a year for four years on top of next year's 45, 47 million. Um, but yeah, so Steph Curry came out saying he's fully committed to the Warriors. He's happy being here. He loves all his draft picks. And he says that he really likes seeing that the Golden State Warriors name is out there going after Nicholas Batum or going after Paddy Mills. And he goes, sometimes that just happens when you don't sign them. Uh, let's move on from that and talk about Kemba Walker, who has agreed to a buyout with OKC uh, and will join the Knicks on a two-year deal uh, worth $8 million each. Uh, but we don't know the details of how much money Kemba Walker left on the table with the Thunder. But Kemba Walker, after all these years, I've watched that UConn step back about 50 times whenever he becomes a free agent. Finally, he'll be coming to the mecca of basketball. Yeah, and he's what is is he third on the depth chart behind D Rose <laughs> and Emmanuel Quigley? <laughs> um, my the 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 thing that I just wonder is. Oklahoma City, in terms of their asset gathering strategy the last like 18 months, have been something like a post-apocalyptic, like Mad Max character, just like stalking the the wasteland world, scavenging for anything that they can get. Second round pick here, oh, protected first round pick up, we'll take it all. <laughs> um, and the fact that they have just decided to cut Kemba Lewis without even trying to get an asset for him means that there must be some fucked up shit going on with Kemba's body for them to <laughs> just like say like this this piece of gear or tech or food is too like nuclearly contaminated for it to even be worth my time. And I'm living on the fucking poverty line. I'm nutritionally like, you know, I'm malnutritioned and I'm not even going to take it. So <laughs> I, I'm very skeptical. You, you, you want to know what else gives it away that maybe Kemba's fucked? Tell me. The Nick signed him. <laughs> well yeah exactly yeah but like like what he this has got to be the second biggest buyout after blake griffin over the last 10 years mm. surely because he had to, he had two years 72 left on his deal yeah and well, that, aren't you sick of living through unprecedented times can't we just go back to the old <laughs> days when like ryan anson gets stretched and it's like oh punitive houston rockets I miss the precedented time. <laughs> I want some precedent. Take please. me back when we just had like five celebrities die in 2019 or whatever. Yeah, true. It was like, it was like who, who was one of the celebrities? Leonard Nimoy died. And I was like, wow, this was a terrible year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually really hate those posts where it's like, oh, David Bowie died. Oh, here's his unreleased album. This is such not a vibe that really pisses me off. It's like you never knew him. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm craving. Mel Melbourne's about to go back into a lockdown. Perth had um, cases, COVID cases uh, confirmed here yesterday. So I'm just like craving those sweet, sweet precedented times. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I could do with some. Um, that's a that's a really sad way to end a pod, but uh, no, it's not because it's going to get sadder. Because before we go, um. I wrote an article <gasps> for our new website, which you may have heard me plug before and on the last episode and which I'll continue to plug, the deep2.com. Sean, is it really that simple? It's that simple. Go to your preferred browser and type in the deep2.com up the top and you'll go to a secure website. That's right. H-T-T-P-S, S for secure, to go to our website. Now, Dante, what's at the top of that website? Gee, he's putting me on the spot here. <laughs> you wrote it. <laughs> I just had to check the order. 
So I wrote a piece uh, basically where I, I utilised some little known technology which can turn tears into uh, <laughs> words and I used all of my tears um, that I cried over the Phoenix Suns losing in the NBA finals and turned them into some words just on a bit of a reflection on my experience of the playoffs being a Suns fan who never expected the team to really do anything and more broadly on my experience of being a Suns fan which as I'm sure listeners are aware has been um, unrewarding would probably be a good way to put it so that's up on the website now um, you can also find it via our instagram and via our facebook so check that out um sean made a lovely little cover image that prominently features everyone's favorite basketball dad monty williams <laughs> basketball dad monty williams basketball grandfather the american commentator from the <laughs> olympics games who someone needs to let us know who that guy is and that's like the ultimate like <laughs> like paternal role models in, in basketball i think all right um well, good plug good pod uh just before we head off we've got three hours until slovenia versus france who's your pick to win because by the time people listen to this the game will be over so a lot of pressure i'm going the little engine that could and i'm gonna pick slovenia France is going to kick the shit out of them. Uh, I think <laughs> they, they like Slovenia hasn't faced a real team. I have not even watched one Slovenia minute, so I'm just fucking oh. putting all my eggs in the Luca basket. Ah, oh, well, yeah. I mean, it, it could still happen, but he gets doubled after every single pick and roll, and it's like, all right, bad team does it. Hey, it's a bit of a weird double that you doubled this dude, but he still hit a step back three over two dudes. That's it's it's not supposed to happen. France, different different story. The Clippers, the, are, the Clippers are doubling. The Clippers are doubling him after every possession. And who, who wins? Who wins a seven-game series between the Clippers and France? <laughs> Two Nick Batum's in one stadium. Who's Nick Batum playing? Yeah, no. okay. <laughs> clone him. Batum on the Batum. Batum on Batum. Like post-up matchup, or like Batum closing out on Batum in the corner. That would be some. That would be some shit that I would love to see. Yeah, Batum just getting a high post bang quick to Rudy. Um, and then the other Batum running down with him, just patting him on the head. Beautiful. <laughs> a man can dream. All right, well, um, good chatting to you, Sean. I'll see you next week. See you then. <laughs>